So I've been joined here by uh, Ahmed Soumare, uh, co-founder and CTO of Dira Partners, uh, and by uh, Melanie Kaita, uh, that is like the co-founder of NCO of uh, Melanie Castro. Um, they are both based in Europe and intervening uh, through their companies. One is based for Melanie in Kenya and uh, for Ahmed in Senegal, Dakar. Um, so without too much further ado, I would like to some of what you have in your brain, guys. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you so much to Adife and AfriLab for having uh, us today, for having Manan Capital. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, maybe I can start uh, with myself. So I'm the, Mel the, the CEO of Melanin Capital. Melanin Capital is actually the first digital investment bank in Africa, serving Africans and the diaspora to invest uh, in uh, sustainable and impactful businesses back home. Uh, the idea behind Melan Capital is really uh, to ensure that uh, African problems can be solved by African solutions. But for this, we need to provide the right infrastructure and the right, um, let's say, financial services so that uh, more um, private investors in Africa and private investors from the diaspora can contribute to the sustainable development of uh, the continent. So we basically offer two services. Um, one is investment processing to formalize small and very small companies before they get access to funding. And the second one is investment structuring, where we work with donors and public investors to structure blended finance uh, investment vehicles, such as guaranteed credit lines or guaranteed equity funds. This way we can ensure that we decrease the risk of investing in those small and very small enterprises. That's basically what we've been doing so far. We've been uh, incorporating in January 2020. And now we're working especially with APSA Bank in Kenya, formerly Barclays, and supporting up to 300 uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs even more so, in Kenya for them to get access to a loan and then equity capital from um, men and capitals impact funds. So that's what we've been up to so far. And we hope that by the end of 2021, we'll be distributing up to 5 million US dollars of loans and 3 million of equity capital. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, so I am Ahmed Soumare. I'm the CTO of uh, Dira Partners. So basically we are um, at the range, we are working just like Melanie Capital on startups and SMEs. Um, so basically Dira Partners is there to provide them with all the accompaniment and to provide them with all the resources. So there is strategy resources, financing, and also uh, make, them, uh, make them find each other between startups and SMEs to make them uh, develop their activities in Africa and also in the diaspora. So basically, this is the, the main activities of DR Partners. And uh, our activity is based on both um, Caribs and Africa. So we aim to develop the African markets with African startups and also startups from the diaspora and we provide them with all the different resources. So we have three different, um, three main activities. The first one is um, about the strategy. So we provide them the strategy to develop their activities, to target African markets or target African diaspora market. And the second one is about the financing. And now we have launched our very uh, early platform named Dira. So the platform is there to make matchmaking between, based on data between investors and also um, startups. So we are very pleased to be there and to represent uh, the African diaspora community. And thank you uh, to Diza and Adife for the invitation. Thank you very much. A very neat presentation, by the way, guys. You were very like respecting the time. I really appreciate that. Uh, so we would like to move with either Cynthia or Armand that I see that are connected right now. Uh, so if one of you guys can, uh, uh, so that you can do a short presentation like Melanie and Ahmed just provided us with. I don't know if you can hear us now. Oh, 
Okay, it seems that uh, Armand and Cynthia are not. Ah, uh, can, can you hear me? We cannot hear you, my friend. Can you hear me? To, uh, now we can hear you a bit more. To... Okay. N now, can you hear me properly? Yeah, we can hear you like quite low, but I think it's getting there. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to present myself. I am uh, Arman Gaitan Gechi. It's a little bit early here where I am in the States, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia State, in the USA. So thank you for giving time uh, to jump on the table and host this big event. event. Uh, I thank uh, Ajife for the initiative and all the partners involved. I am Arman Gaitan Gechi, the founder and CEO at UBTS International Corp, uh, based here in Atlanta and uh, targeting emerging markets with the priority uh, as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are a global think tank, a uh, telecom platform company. So uh, we were formed with the sole purpose to rethink and disrupt uh, the all way of doing in the telecom industry. Uh, we, we have been existing since three years and uh, we managed to secure the telecom license in the first country where we started an affiliate company in Cameroon. So uh, what we do is to really architect uh, processes, framework, tools, governance, mechanisms, and platforms in the telecom space. And uh, also we, from a technology standpoint, we are trying to mix the Wi-Fi style deployment with the cellular, the regular cellular style deployment. So I'm also a digital strategy expert uh, with almost 10 years of experience in three continents. Thank you. Cynthia can take over now. I'm not sure if Cynthia is having maybe some issue connecting. She's on mute. Maybe she's speaking on mute. You you muted apparently, Cynthia. The, the, the tech team is telling me that your microphone is muted, so you will need to put on camera. Do we have Vanessa with us too? Is she online? Can you tell me, Andrew? We're a bit sorry, guys. Like that's the the moment where we still have technicalities and we're still like running um, the opening. So um, okay. So we will go ahead with what we have, and when Cynthia can come in, uh, I will give her the floor so that she can brief us a tiny bit on what she's doing and and what her company is about. Um, so thank you for uh, introducing us, guys. Uh, I think one of the, the, the main point we can discuss here uh, with the people we have around is really this aspect of how can Hello? step in. Vanessa, do you Hello? hear us? No, it's Cynthia. Cynthia, sorry. Ah, yes, ah, now it's us? working. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, I wasn't muted, but uh, I don't know why the sound wasn't going through. Sorry. Okay. Could you could you eventually like activate the camera and and, and tell us a bit more about yes. the company? Hello, everybody. Hi, hello. We see you. Hi. Uh, finally. Much for us. Um, I hope everybody is doing fine. Um, yeah, we're fine. What about you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, yeah. So yes, I'm actually the founder of African Gist, um, which is a an organization. Um, more like a learning platform, we are building a community of digitally enabled creatives uh, based in Africa and also in the diaspora. Um, we are doing it through uh, training, training in uh, how to use digital tools in order to grow ventures, uh, very early stage businesses, uh, to sustain them, but also to, to make them more profitable. 
because we've noticed that uh, the creative industry uh, is not really seen as um, as um, uh, contributing to the African economy. At the same time, what we are doing with uh, with our platform, we are trying to foster further collaboration between the diaspora and uh, the creatives that are in Africa. So they can benefit from the, the, the experience of the, the, the diaspora to find, uh, like to collaborate, find, and, um, and, and set in place solutions to local uh, problems, uh, improving them the situation of the, their community, uh, but also uh, making their venture be more profitable. At the moment, like I said, we are more focusing on training uh, these people in how to start a business, what is important to, to know about uh, uh, when you start a business, how to raise uh, money. But then uh, our goal is over time to allow them to have access uh, to funding. Um, this is why I'm looking at uh, Melanin Capital here, <laughs> ECB. Um, you will be needed soon. <laughs> this is basically what we are doing. Thank you for also explaining us. Uh, I think this is really. You, you guys, you guys are breaking up a little bit. We cannot hear you. And Andrew, we cannot hear you. The that, line is breaking that, up. That's why my, my my company exists, you know, internet, you know, a big event like this for the continent, you know. Yeah, that's why we exist at UVTS. Unfortunately. Can that's I terrible. The... We lost them. Hey, Cynthia, how are you doing? And thank you. How are you doing? Uh, just trying to survive <laughs> COVID and. Yusuf, uh, I see your personal profile. Are you here, Yusuf? Oh, crazy. Audrey? Aud Audrey, can you hear us? Audrey or Yusuf, can you hear us? Or Amandine? I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, we've lost them. Yes, um, I, I think they're trying to solve the, the technical issues that, that is being taking place on, on site. Hello? Um, Hello? Can you hear us now? Yes. Back? Yes. yes, we're back. Okay, sorry guys. Yeah, it was a bit of a jump on the on the internet connection. Uh, <laughs> I was going to, to, to bounce actually on both your intervention because we continued uh, hearing from you. So thank you like also uh, to start like speaking among, among yourselves, guys. Um, Yusuf is around. He's not on this panel, but he's around. Like he's walking around doing what you should does best, like building networks everywhere. Um, so right now, I think one of the very cool thing is exactly what you you, you just said, uh, Cynthia, and also the fact that you can contribute to a solution uh, with us also. Um, bring in contact directly with Melanie, for example, and Melanie Capital. Um, this is really what it's about. 
DIDA is really about like creating a space so that entrepreneurs from the diaspora and from the continent can enter in contact with each other and jointly build the next ecosystem and the next solutions that are needed. Find the complementarities, the synergy, and go ahead with that. So I think right now we can see that all of you guys are there to facilitate how to do business here on the continent and bring around skills that are needed and that will benefit the next generation of entrepreneurs and the one running today. So then they can catch up eventually with some of the innovative work that are going on. I see that we are luckily having the finance part, the creative industry part, the think tank models, all of these kind of things happening here. So I think one of my first question would be, right now, one of the biggest obstacle, right? And it will be more dedicated to you guys, Melanie and, and, and Ahmed, um, is actually access to finance. Like you just say, Cynthia, you were like, we need you already because we need to, after we give the capacity, we provide the skills for the people to build their business model and their company, we need to access financing in a proper manner and in a way that is also like sustainable and adapted for the needs of those young people engaging with the continent, right? So for me, it would be like, for example, right, Cynthia is fostering the part that is on creative industry, building skills, how could, for example, either Melanin Capital or Dira Partners support those young people into entering the next phase? Once they have their business model that they can approach you guys, what would be the easiest for them? And I will start with Melanie first and then Thank you. Thank you so lot for, for the question and for the connection to Cynthia. I'd be happy to continue the conversation after. Um, so Yes, indeed, to give access to finance for young people is always difficult because uh, the financial sector in Africa, actually most of the capital is coming from banks uh, and the banks have very strict uh, ways of assessing uh, businesses and very strict ways of uh, uh, in internally of, um, of uh, yeah, assessing risk when it comes to financing small businesses. So, of course, um, when we look at... <coughs> Uh, banks financing, we often see a lot of corporates being financed and instead of young people and local small businesses because it's just too costly and risky for the banks to do so. And this is why uh, with Melon Capital, we actually try to digitize that process through investment processing and by formalizing the entrepreneur from A to Z for them to be able to get access to a loan. So we start by giving them access to a banking and financial tool to be able to um, basically track records from their mobile money account and their bank account. Then once we have proper financial statements, we actually audit them with a methodology that we're developing with PwC. And then we rate them with a methodology of a rating agency called Bloomfield Investment. So then you have the full package really at, uh, that you offer to the bank with an entrepreneur that has been cross-checked by third parties and that is able to get access to, to a loan. And for the bank, it lowers for them the transaction costs so they can actually directly uh, invest without having to visit the company and audit them themselves. And then what we add on top is our investment structuring service where we provide guarantees uh, and blended finance with public donors that then will provide the first loss facility. And this way, the bank is a bit less um, is nervous of providing the loan uh, because they are guaranteed up to 70%. So this way you don't have to actually ask for collateral because that's also one of the biggest barriers of young entrepreneurs is to be able to provide the collateral that uh, the bank is asking them. So now with the, uh, the solution that we are putting on the market, that's what we're trying to do. And we are working with amazing change makers like Cynthia to be able to support more uh, young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are not included in the financial markets, particularly women uh, or the youth. So yeah, it's uh, still a challenge, but trying to work on it. Well, thank you, Jan, for the question. Uh, basically, I think I, I will join Melanie and uh, with your experience, what we saw in Dira Partners is that 
we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs struggling to find to have access to smart capital and having access to the finance having access to develop their activities and the first thing we we saw is that nowadays what we need is to have sustainable startups and for that we are fostering innovation through innovation we are fostering between connection um, with connection between investors and startups so we we really think that there is uh, this is the the way we can resolve the problem providing uh, a smart access to capital and we have basically um, two answers to that first of all we provide um, what we call a strategy and accompaniment for startups so what we saw is that most of them they don't have the the right accompaniment or they don't have the right uh, business models or strategy to develop their activity in Africa or in diaspora. So um, to, um, this is one of the, the first thing we saw. So to answer that question, what we, what we did is that we developed um, a council activity. And so with the consulting part, uh, we are providing them strategy, business development, and also providing them with uh, all the structure they need and the second part is about financing. So uh, what we do is now we have made a data-driven platform that is making, uh, so it's matchmaking between investors and startups. So the whole thing is about providing systematics. So removing the systematic, uh, let's say that, uh, the things that people think that, okay, startups in Africa, they are not us, um, they are not as structured as startups in, in, in Europe or, or the continent and provide them with all the, the right documents, the right uh, strategy to enter those investors. And we are also providing within our platform um, a smart way for them to have access to the capital and also have access to investors that will accompany them and will give them all the counsel they need. So we really think that we need sustainable startups in Africa nowadays. And we also need to have really a lot of data collected in the African market to make it uh, more in, to make more investors come in the market and invest in different startups. Thank you very much for, for, for answering that question. Um, I think that was quite clear th what you highlighted, like that you're bringing around solutions that are more adapted to eventual interventions and geared towards also some of the fringe of the population that was not included yet, especially on your side. I, I, I think like we will come back to that. Um, but we're agreeing that in order to be able to what you're doing, guys, you know, you need the technological support. validation for that, that also you have access to connections and everything like this. So for that, like I, I will go back um, to, uh, wait, was it changing slide? Um, I will go back actually to um, Armand, please, if you can tell us a bit more of the solution that you're bringing and the development on your side, like of digital strategy, so that, and also the implementation of technology, like hard technologies, so that you're also developing how can people access different technology to increase connectivity and all of these, like more what what you are like implementing right now on the ground. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an excellent question, uh, touching the key critical aspects of the digital world. So before I go uh, into your question, give me a chance to remind everybody in which world we are right now we call the world where we are right now the industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution so what is exactly the fourth industrial revolution so today we have three characteristics of the world the, the, the fourth industrial revolution the first is the massive volume of digitized data the second is the combinatorial people machines, networks, uh, replicate easily uh, practices and fastly uh, connected uh, architectures. The third is the exponential growth dictated by some laws 
you have the Moore law, you have the, 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 the Metcalfe law for the network effects and so on. So that's the three entry points to understand the world where we are today. So what means digitize? Because when we talk about the contribution of the technology uh, to the development of, of Africa, what technology are we talking about? What is the real keywords behind the term technology? So in the digital strategy science, everything is about the data. So when you talk about technology, you, you are talking about the data first. And now the, the digitalization is the orchestration of the data. So what means digitize? It's a process to store, retrieve, to communicate, to connect with multiple directional flows, to analyze, compare, decompose, combine, predict, optimize, simulate, present, visualize, and so on. So that's the different verbs, you know, attached to the term digitize. So once we understand the, the, the three different drivers and what means digitize, you quickly see the infrastructure is the backbone of everything. So I'm talking about the, 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 the key component that gives the ability to exploit all the different capabilities you can have in the digital world. And at the finish, bring the technology from a point A to a point B, because it, it, the technology has a value chain all the way from the one who produced the technology with the data at the core, all the way to the customers where you bring, where you provide essentially the value. And in essence, the strategy is to provide the value to the people at the end, at the top end of the value chain, and then take a part of that value for your own business and scale and sustainability. So this is where I start talking about the data infrastructure and the network infrastructure because the industry 4.0 is a mix of internet of things all the objects we have smart watches a smartphones a, a smart watch uh, uh, a smart car a smart fridge whatever what is which is connected smart aircraft so it's about all these connected objects and the, the, the mix of interconnected systems. So the telecom today, or the way of connecting people is at the heart of the process. So today, uh, the key for Africa of any other uh, environment today is to make the most of what the network architecture can bring to people first. Because as more as, you know, I just, you know, you guys just had like some uh, network issues and sometimes it happened to billions of people. Um, watching now the, the population of Africa, it's about 1.3 billion. And today the key is how to really push the infrastructure all the way down to those 1.3 billion to enable a good quality access because the key today is not just to connect people but to connect people with a good quality access i don't want to go much in the technical you know mechanics behind no the way of connecting well people but what i can say is from our side we think uh, is the time now to to really be focused on how to connect people well using world-class standard processes, tools, technology. So at UBTS, this is the, the path we are taking right now to rethink the telecom from an opposite way the, the actual incumbent company have been doing for years. So what we do is we have an inclusive approach on the design of the solution, starting with the communities first. So when we get to a country, Yes. So when we got, we call this a UBTS adaptive design thinking. Mm -hmm. So when we get to a country, we are not coming to the country with the money and solutions like most of the company does. No, we come to the company with a pen and a paper. 
we work with the locals to understand their pains. And based on that, we go all the way up and crafting the solution to fill the gaps alongside with the locals. So we spend some time doing that. And after that, we build the solution uh, based on what we got on the ground with the communities first. And second, the government. So we include the government because essentially telecom is a proprietary sovereign activity. So you need licensing, you need some sort of uh, authorization from the government. So we work alongside with the regulators, you know, okay. to feel exactly what they need in terms of requirement to be able to operate yeah, as a telco company. And what we do is we orchestrate a kind of think tank so uh, all the way from where we have more experience here in the States, I mean, the States right now, the telecom has been born in the United States. So they got a lot of experience in the telecom space. So what we do is we orchestrate that with the locals all the way down to emerging countries. So we set two-way partnerships and collaboration and co-creation and co-creation it's not like people in Africa, they, 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 they cannot do no. We understand from them and they understand from the team here. So we put a kind of two way way of working and co create. Yes, absolutely. This is what we do at UBTS. So this is what we did to design. At the time I'm speaking right now, we, we have been working with the locals in Cameroon, our first country where we set an affiliate company to design a network architecture from scratch that can okay. solve 20 million people customers. So we are about to roll out by March, 2022. Great, we will follow that with, with a lot of attention, I think. I, I think like I really, I really like the fact that um, you're offering a grassroots based way of approaching the issue of connectivity, because like you said, a lot of time, it's big players coming in, setting up a bunch of cables around, throwing satellites, offering like basically connectivity solutions, but the population living there is not actually like made aware of that all of the solutions are happening and it's not tailored at all to some of their needs. So I think like this is like really great what the fact that even access to technology should be based on demand driven and not on ways of operating as we've been knowing so far, that it gives like a more flexible framework so that people can find what they really need, having the expertise from people, bringing them solutions, but at the end, they are also explaining them, this is what I would need in my daily operation. Especially, for example, in remote areas, like smallholders, farmers that want to access market, that are like facing now, like the development of e-commerce uh, situation, like technologies and all of this, and that are left on the side. At some point, like we're able also to, to nowadays with the technologies that are available through mobile banking, through small investment also partners that are supporting those people, the technology that you're bringing to bring around like new solutions, I think, that can literally li lift those people out of some of the conditions they're in right now, which is like close to being vulnerable, that sometimes like they're so cold. I just think that they're just out of some of the development streams, like economical streams and digitalization can bring them around. Um, I will now like go, go, go on like with, uh, with uh, Cynthia, I think. Um, for one question, I know that you're working a lot with uh, creative industry. And I know that one of the main challenge of the creative industry is actually people are a lot forgetting about the fact that there is industry in the world creative industry. And it's a lot of left on the side of some of the major investment when we're talking about how to develop industry nowadays. A lot of time we think about like factories, we think about like hard infrastructural development. And there is like the part of creative industry that is a bit like left on the side. And I would like you to give us eventually a brief overview on how technology nowadays, social media, especially in the context of the COVID crisis. Sorry to ask you that one. But you know, I know that creative industry has been one of the one the most impacted by this entire crisis. Uh, I have a lot of people around me that are actually like uh, in, in the creative industry, and I know how hard it has been for them. So, how 
technology helped you go through hard times, but also in general, how technology and digitalization and those new solutions that are being developed today are literally helping you to lift out this industry. And now it's occupying more and more the forefront of the scene, like through all those social media, the capacity to develop art from basically your pocket with your phone and to go ahead. Like if you can give us like a brief overview on these challenges, opportunity, what is technology bringing to your sector? Um, we, we've been, um, how to say, uh, we've been doing uh, advocacy for technology for a long time, since, since the beginning. And it's true that sometimes uh, the people who are approaching, when I say the people, it's more the creative uh, youth who are approaching, we're not seeing technology as that important, uh, simply because some of them are operating from very rural uh, areas where they don't really need mo much more than just a phone, a cell phone, or if you talk about a fashion designer, they already have their own uh, customers and they don't really, they weren't really thinking of how can I use Instagram, how can I use social media to actually make money, you know? Um, but what happened during the, the COVID crisis, we realized within our community that uh, most of the creatives uh, were really freaked out. They were really scared. And for some of them, um, it was a, really a matter of survival. We can't go out. We can't meet, physically meet with our clients. We cannot network, physically networking. It was not possible anymore. And we actually, looking at everything that was happening within our network, we decided to launch a campaign called the Entrepreneur Talk because we realized that at that, that moment, at that time, our community really needed to be, to feel as part of a community and to feel supported. You know, you know being a creative in an environment like in Africa is not always easy because in some countries, uh, like in Nigeria, where we have a lot of... Uh, of members, families or uh, surroundings don't really understand why you want to become a, a blogger or um, a creative person. It doesn't bring money. And it's the same thing within the diaspora, you know, when your parents struggle so much to uh, arrive in Europe, uh, they really sacrifice a lot and they want for their children to be working in an office. This is why they call success. And when you tell them about your creative passion, to them, it has to remain a passion. So a creative person can really feel alone, lonely, and they don't have a lot of support. So we decided to create that uh, that campaign where different entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs based all over the, all around the continent, were giving them tips and tricks on how to survive during the, the COVID pandemic, how to business running. Doing so. We were able to foster a collaboration, yes, between entrepreneurs in Africa and Europe, but also within Africa. There are some uh, uh, contacts were made. How do you do in your country? I wasn't able to sustain my magazine. How can I do? And they, they, they just created that um, um, support, you know, on how to, to go through uh, the pandemic. And everything was done online. And we know that uh, one of the major um, struggles in Africa uh, when it comes to digital businesses are basically access to internet. In some countries, it's very expensive. Um, you don't always have the, the, the proper connection, but um, we really made our community understand that digital is the, the way to go now. And we've, we've realized that after, I cannot say that we are behind behind the pandemic, but since then, we've seen an increase in the demands around um, yes, uh, digital solution. We also had to uh, improvise <laughs> at some point because we had a schedule uh, on, uh, of trainings. You know, we do our trainings live. So we travel to Nigeria, we travel to Ghana, we travel to Congo, anywhere to meet with our community and to offer our trainings. So for us, it was more about, okay, what are we going to do if we cannot meet with them can we really sustain what we are doing through solely digital tools? So it was also for us <laughs> the time to, um, 
to say uh, to do what you what we were preaching you know i don't know if you you get what i'm trying to say but it was also for us to really trust um digital tools to operate and it wasn't easy but we did it we partnered with several organizations uh, to provide our, our our trainings through digital platform, we thought we would not have a lot of show, um, like uh, people showing up to our event. But it was really the opposite. We conducted five trainings, and it was always sold out. Uh, we realized that okay, our community was ready to follow us, uh, despite despite everything. And uh, going forward, moving forward, we are really thinking of expanding our digital offers. Uh, maybe it will also help us uh, touch more people uh, through it. Um, and, and regarding the creatives who are uh, basically following us, we, we've noticed a, a change in the demands. Um, first of all, indeed, they wanted to know how uh, they could use social media to showcase their ventures. But now the demands are more um, into how can I create a website on my own, you know, more tech oriented. Um, how can I uh, generate money, you know, from um, from digital uh, uh, using digital platforms, etc. So, in one sense, COVID was not really a bad thing for us. It really opened the door of opportunity, and we really hope to be more uh, present uh, in that area for our community. I really just. I'm smiling a lot right now because you basically gave me my perfect transition. I wanted exactly you to say something like this, that basically the, 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 this pandemic, um, as much as it has been impactful and, and disastrous for a lot of people that uh, thought so with us, uh, with them, sorry. Um, it has also forced, I think, all of us entrepreneurs um, to rethink our models and to see how to find our own solutions. Because right now, also, we, we, we can say, I know that too controversial here. here. I'm not going to go like on political statements, no anything. But what happened and what has been happening for a very long while, and places like this, like Giva, are the, thing. the fact that you guys are here today, thanks again for being here and for sharing with us like all the amazing things that you're doing, um, either here in my presence or here uh, over the internet. Um, it's the fact that the actual working through this crisis was done by people for the people. It has been entrepreneurs starting developing solutions to help other entrepreneurs that were struggling, trying to build ecosystem online, online economy communities like soft clusters. So, okay, you're here, I'm here, let's link up. I have like a platform that is allowing you to showcase your product. So right now you showcase, I'm opening your market on my side. I need build up my website. It's not so well done. So this entire dynamic of helping each other and sharing what we have and trying to compensate for a world that was going down kind of without clear guidelines from authorities on when it will go back up, when we will be able to continue on our daily operations as per usual, has forced us to really innovate, I think, way stronger and way faster, and a lot of it with compassion. And I think this brought back also a lot of heart within the businesses that we're all leading. Because nowadays, since the last two years, when I was asking people to explain to me what they were doing, a lot of time they were only talking about their business. It was numbers, it was next that's the next activity we're deploying a b c d etc now in all of your intervention what is happening is like human is at the core of it you basically really basing yourself on like how can the beneficiary of my product is to be impacted what can i make in their life a difference through what i'm doing in my project and i think this is like a complete shift from what used to be done, it's not brand new, of course, but it has been completely, according to me, like bolstered by this entire crisis because people were re-engaging with each other at a new level. So I think right now, 
by all of your intervention. And I would like to eventually also go back on eventually on the financing side very quickly because we're nearly done. I wanted to ask you guys like more questions. Um, but just also like the side of the of the pandemic, like on your side, the fact that you're offering financing solutions that are reachable online, did you see an increase in demand on your product? Did you see people reaching out to you way more than usual? Or did it to business? How did you handle it? Thanks for that question. So undoubtedly, um, COVID-19 uh, boosted our operations because especially for Melanin Capital that works a lot on the banking side, uh, a lot of our countries uh, don't have digital banking. That is uh, why they develop, especially when it comes to disbursing loans. Maybe you have an online bank account, but when it comes to directly applying for a loan and getting it disbursed, that's another story. So, of course, our loans are being boosted and it's not only entrepreneurs that are asking on that side, it's also the bank because the banks need uh, to digitize their operations if they want to also reach last mile delivery uh, and they need to be able to, um, to, to grow basically their markets outside of the corporate segment. So yes, on that side we've been boosted. I would say that when it comes to investors in our funds, it's a bit of a, a different story because I think COVID at the beginning really made everyone very anxious and very skeptical about investing back in the continent. Um, but when you have a mandate, like a lot of institutional investors to invest in Africa, at some point you just have to find solutions, right? So then it was about understanding how they can do the usual due diligences that they were doing on the on the continent directly on the ground. How could they do it fully uh, online? How could they rely on people also on the grounds partners that could uh, do the due diligences for them? So this is where our solution is becoming very interesting to have a fund management, digital fund management tool where they can to see the due diligence monitoring and disbursement. Uh, but yeah, now um, that situation is going a little bit back to normal, we can see that actually a lot of those habits of working online and digitally have sticked, which is good because that could exactly forced people um, that were really uh, relying on paper and relying on one-to-one -one physical interactions to really rethink the way they were doing finance and uh, actually going a mile forward. And countries like Kenya where um, mobile money and digital finance is widely accepted let's say, went even forward. But for our countries in French Africa, for example, where it is a little bit less uh, widely developed, had to actually do that shift. And I think even the regulators are saying more and more that they need to provide the enabling environments for us to be able to support and link up the ecosystem. So this is very positive. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. Um, I completely agree. And what I see, what we have seen during the pandemic is that there, there was a big shift, and I really love to say that uh, we are nowadays in, in the third biggest uh, revolution the world is facing. So I'm calling this the digital revolution, and I'm really comparing that to what Adam Smith used to say, the industrial revolution in Europe. Uh, and what we now have is that uh, people or startups in Africa are really thinking now digital as a tool and not just as a way to develop fintechs or et cetera. So I really encourage them to continue in that way. And we are sure that with a data-driven platform that will provide them with access to investors and have access to investors in other countries or the continent without having to go through all the different difficulties, this is actually something I think uh, need to be done in Africa and also in, inside the diaspora. So to make their startups, activities, and founders work together and uh, develop sustainable and really smart uh, smart uh, uh, capital access. So that's what we think, and this is the purpose uh, we, we've been targeting with Jira Partners for many years. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Perfect, guys. On the top of it, you were very like timely, uh, which is needed right now. We have like three minutes left on this session. Um, 
So wrapping it up on my side, uh, first like to have been part of this. Uh, thanks again to Afri Labs and, and Adife, but most of it like to you guys for being part of it because you're actually being the event. Um, I was very lucky, I think, on my side because first I was the one opening the session. So we had a bit of technicalities that threw the game a bit out at the beginning. Uh, forgive us for that. But now I think everything should, should go uh, running very smoothly. And the second side of the why I'm feeling very uh, privileged to, to be here uh, is actually being able to support and help to the max of my capacity shed the light on what is really transforming today the continent and how the diaspora is now like a driving force towards making Africa emerge at the international level even more than what it has been doing right now. Um, what I've seen also is that right now we have the backbone in terms of the technology to, to get back your, 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 your saying, Armand. Um, so we have kind of the value chain of entrepreneurship around the table here. We have like the part of bringing the technology and the infrastructure to allow people to take it to the next level, having the financing part, being able to make actually the project exist and sustainably live through and get the needed funding that they need to drive the project. And we have also like project builders and sectoral like intervention. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Vanessa was not able to be there. She would have brought also the part on really like how to, through digitalization, be able to integrate the job market. Um, so I think now like we've been setting a bit the tone for the rest of the, of the conference. Um, on my side, it was an honor. You can check everybody's profile. Once again, please go on Swap Card, go on the profile on the different people, interact with each other, exchange contacts. It's there for that. And the next panel will be talking with how to share solution and ensure soft lending from diaspora entrepreneurs wanting to go back and set shop in the country of origin or somewhere over the continent. And yes, just stick around. Thanks again for your time being around. Thank you everyone for the panel. Really, really appreciate it. Really feeling blessed. And yeah, let's continue the good work. They're already there. You 